Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. I'm here with a head start to A-level chemistry video where we're going to take a look at covalent structures and their properties. As with all of my head start videos, I'm going to take a look at the core content of GCSE chemistry relevant to this topic that you need to bring with you into A-level chemistry and I'm going to intersperse some A-level content as well so you can get a literal head start to your course and you can start your lessons ready in September knowing a bit about the A-level content that you'll be doing early in the course. Hopefully you remember that one element bonds to another in order to achieve a full outer energy level or shell of electrons. How they do this depends on where you find them in the periodic table and what they are bonding with. When a metal bonds to a non-metal, you make ions and the size of the ion depends on the group of the periodic table. More about that in some of my other videos about ionic compounds. When you're making a covalent compound, what happens is non-metals share electrons. And so the non-metals are on the right-hand side of this periodic table. We're not talking about group zero elements typically because they already have a complete outer energy level of electrons. So we're talking about group seven, some group six and group five, and also hydrogen over here when we're making simple covalent molecules. And they form by sharing pairs of electrons. Typically, they might share two electrons, one from each of the two elements from their outer shell. And once they've done that, they will complete their outer shell of electrons. And so here we can show these as sticks, sometimes just written as, as dashes. And this is probably the, in the, the easiest form of notation and the simplest. We can also show them as dot and cross diagrams where you show all of the electrons that an element has got and you show the shells overlapping. That's what I've got in the circles here. And you show as dots the electrons that belong to one of the atoms and crosses the electrons that bond to one of the other atoms. The third type is very similar to the second type, but it's a simplified version of the previous one because all we do is we show the outer shell electrons or the valence electrons because those are the electrons that are involved in bonding. And so you can see the picture looks quite similar, but we only show the outer shell electrons and sometimes we can do them without even showing the shells themselves and we just literally show the electrons as a dot and a cross sort of sandwiched between each of the atoms in the covalent bond. And so all of these four diagrams that I've shown here are showing the same molecule and the same bonding, just in subtly different ways. Not only can we use the periodic table to work out the type of bonding that will occur between two elements, we can also work out how many covalent bonds will be present between the different elements, again by looking at their position in the periodic table. For instance, if we look at hydrogen here in group one of the periodic table, it needs to have two electrons in order to have a full outer shell. And you can work that out, remember, by looking at how many elements there are in period one. There are two, so hydrogen already has got one electron in its outer shell, it needs a second. So hydrogen will form one covalent bond. And then if we look at the elements of group seven, they've obviously got seven electrons in their outer shell and they need to be like the noble gases, which have got eight electrons in their outer shell. And so they need to form one covalent bond as well because seven plus one makes the eight that they need. And then if we look at group six, for instance, oxygen, oxygen has six electrons in its outer shell. It wants to be like the noble gas neon and so it needs to get an extra two electrons in its outer shell because six and two makes eight. Similarly, nitrogen with five needs three covalent bonds because five and three makes eight. And last of all, probably the most common element that you'll draw covalent bonds for will be carbon, which is this atom here. And carbon is in group four of the periodic table. It needs an additional four electrons to complete its outer energy level. So that means it will form four covalent bonds. 
As a result of this, when you're drawing covalent molecules, you can have an idea in your back of your mind that I'm drawing carbon bonding to something, so I know that carbon needs to have four sticks coming out of it. Now, those might not all be going to the same elements, so for instance in methane here we've got four sticks going to four separate hydrogen atoms but in carbon dioxide that we're showing here we've got two sticks going to one oxygen and two sticks going to the other oxygen showing that these are double covalent bonds and instead of two electrons being shared in one pair like the single sticks are these funny looking sort of equal signs are showing four electrons being shared or two pairs of electrons being shared and you can even have triple bonds as well, as you can see in this hydrogen cyanide molecule, where the hydrogen has bonded to the carbon. That's one of carbon's four bonds that it needs, because carbon's in group four. And we have got three bonds to the nitrogen atom, which therefore gives carbon a total of four covalent bonds. And indeed, one nitrogen bonds to another nitrogen with a triple covalent bond, because that's how many extra electrons nitrogen needs to complete its outer shell. Sometimes you can get covalent bonds forming where it isn't one dot and one cross, or in other words, it's not one electron from one element and one electron from another. And in this situation, you get what is called a dative covalent bond, or sometimes it's called a coordinate bond instead. And when that happens, both of the shared electrons in the covalent bond are coming from the same atom. So, for instance, in the ammonium ion, which you will have encountered at GCSE, that's formed when ammonia, which is shown here, gains a hydrogen ion, and we form this complex looking thing here, which overall has got a positive charge. And you can see from the electron sharing diagram that I've drawn here, that for the nitrogen to hydrogen bond on the right hand side, I've shown two dots. And both of those are representing electrons from the nitrogen atom. That hydrogen ion that has joined on did not contribute any electrons from itself, from its own outer shell, because it didn't have any. And so nitrogen is considered to be the, the, the donor. And so if you were to draw a stick diagram, you would draw those three on the up and down and the left position as being regular sticks, regular covalent bonds, and then the one on the right would be shown as an arrow to show the, the direction of the donation. That nitrogen is sharing both of them from its own outer shell to the hydrogen that didn't have any. And so this dative covalent bond is in fact indistinguishable from the others, but we do recognise it because that gives us an idea about how that bond actually originated. All of these molecules that I've been drawing are called simple covalent molecules. And the distinguishing feature of a simple covalent molecule is typically that they are small, but they're not always small. In fact, really, covalent molecules are considered to be things that have got a formula. So CH4, CO2, H2O, etc. are the typical formulae that we'll encounter. But you can get other molecules that are much larger and are still simple covalent molecules. For instance, C60, one of the fullerenes that you learnt about at GCSE level, also a simple covalent molecule because it has got a formula. And so we can draw all of these different simple covalent molecules in the way that we've been describing. They often don't have anything in common, but they sometimes do exist as families. For instance, hydrocarbons, which I'll do more about in a different organic chemistry video, but the hydrocarbon family, the alkanes, they have got a lot in common. For instance here, methane, ethane, propane and butane. They all have something in common that they're only made of carbon and hydrogen, and all the carbon atoms are single covalent bonds. So simple covalent molecules might have something in common with each other, but not necessarily. Typically, some of the things that they might have in common are their physical properties rather than their chemical properties, because chemical properties can be quite varied. And so the physical properties that you need to know about at GCSE level are electrical conductivity and solubility. So if we take solubility at first, 
in general, simple covalent molecules are non-polar and so they are not soluble. And that's because they don't mix readily with water or they don't dissolve very well in this. And that's because when something dissolves in water, there needs to be an attractive force between water molecules and the substance that they are dissolving. And simple covalent molecules don't form very strong attractions to water, not as strong as the attractions that are already there between two or more water molecules themselves. And so there isn't enough of a new attraction to break that pre-existing attraction between the water molecules. So, for example, those hydrocarbons that I showed on the previous page, they are very much insoluble in water and they will form distinct layers which, after they've settled, they'll separate out and typically the oil will float on top of the water because these simple covalent molecules are not soluble. Sometimes you can get polar covalent molecules, as we'll discuss later in this video, though. Typically, also, simple covalent molecules do not conduct electricity. That's because in order for electric current to flow through a substance, you need some charged particles, whether that's delocalized electrons or ions, and they need to be able to move and carry that electric current. Now, since simple covalent molecules don't have any of these charged particles, they can't conduct electricity, and we can consider them to be electrical insulators. The third property that you need to know about is the melting and boiling point of simple covalent molecules. Now, typically these are very low, very, very low, in fact. They're so low that the majority of simple covalent molecules that you will have encountered will be gases at room temperature. So, for instance, we know water is a liquid at room temperature. That's actually almost an exception. The vast majority of compounds are going to be gases. And the reason for that is to do with what actually happens when you melt or boil something. What you have to do is you have to overcome the attractive forces between these different simple covalent molecules. And so if we just consider these two blue circles to be two different molecules, there will be some attractive forces holding them together, particularly when they are a solid. And these forces need to be overcome in order to melt this substance and make it turn into a liquid. Now, if we're going to vaporize it, we need to break those forces completely and separate these molecules and make them into a random, organized, completely no symmetry, high energy gas situation. Now, these forces are very weak in simple covalent molecules, and so not very much energy is required to overcome them, even to boil them. And so that's why typically the boiling point of a simple covalent molecule is really low, and as such, simple covalent molecules will be gases at room temperature. I've said that typically simple covalent molecules are gases at room temperature. So when aren't they and why aren't they gases at room temperature? Well, it comes down to these intermolecular forces that I've just been mentioning. There are three different types of intermolecular force, but the type of intermolecular force that's present in all different substances is called van der Waals forces, or sometimes it's called temporary dipole induced dipole forces. Now that's a very complicated name and the description of how these forces arise is something you'll learn more about at A level. But something that I think you can get a head start on now is knowledge that these intermolecular forces vary as the size of the molecule varies. For instance, and specifically, the larger the simple covalent molecule is, the stronger these van der Waals forces will be. And so, as you know, a hydrocarbon, as it gets longer, has a larger boiling point. Think about fractional distillation and why the fractions separate and condense at different heights. That's to do with the boiling point of the different hydrocarbons. And that's to do with the strength of these van der Waals forces. Something like decane, which is C10H22, has much stronger van der Waals forces than methane CH4. And that's simply to do with the molecular size. And so you can imagine that as that molecule gets longer and longer and longer, it is far more likely that it won't be a gas at room temperature and it will actually be a solid, 
or certainly a liquid, but actually potentially a solid. And that's why a lot of substances that aren't made of metal or ionic substances at all, like plastics, are actually a solid at room temperature because their molecules, their polymers, are so large that the van der Waals forces between the molecules are so strong that actually room temperature does not provide enough energy to overcome the forces between the polymer chains. The, fo the forces are too strong. These van der Waals forces are too strong because the molecules are so large. The other two types of intermolecular force arise because of something called bond polarity. Now, we know what a bond is, and we're talking about covalent bonds, but polarity is something that is worth clarifying. So a pole is like a positive and a negative. Now, in covalent molecules, there aren't positives and negatives, but there are partially positive elements and there are partially negative elements and that's to do with the ability that elements have got to attract electrons towards themselves in a covalent bond. Now that's actually called electronegativity and you'll learn more about that at A level. And the elements that are really good at attracting electrons towards themselves are probably the ones that you would expect, the ones over here towards fluorine in the periodic table. And in fact, that trend increases as we head towards fluorine on the right-hand side. That is the most electronegative element. It's really good at attracting electrons towards itself. And similarly, it gets worse as we go down here towards the lower group one elements. So rubidium and francium isn't actually on my periodic table here, but that would be the, the lowest electronegativity. And so when you get a covalent bond between something like hydrogen and fluorine or hydrogen and chlorine, you get a polar covalent bond because the chlorine pulls the electrons slightly closer towards itself than they would be if they were exactly 50-50. So for instance, chlorine combined with chlorine, that would be an exactly equal share of those electrons because they're both equally good at pulling electrons towards themselves. Whereas chlorine with hydrogen or chlorine with carbon, it wouldn't be an equal split because the chlorine would pull the electrons towards themselves. And similarly, fluorine and oxygen pull the electrons slightly closer to themselves. And so these elements, when they are involved in simple covalent molecules, end up being slightly negatively charged. And we write that as the Greek lowercase d, and, and we might say delta minus. And the element that they're bonded to ends up being slightly positively charged or deficient in electrons, and we write delta plus. And so that means that as a result of this, the bonds are slightly polar. And so that means that there is a different force between molecules that are polar, and that leads to intermolecular forces being stronger. And so that's why you can get seemingly quite small molecules like water that actually have to get quite hot in order to boil them. 100 degrees C is typically quite a high temperature to boil a simple covalent molecule. And that's down to these intermolecular forces that are between water molecules. And those intermolecular forces arise due to bond polarity. And I, I'm, I said that there were three intermolecular forces in total. There is the van der Waals forces that I mentioned previously, and there are two different forces that arise due to bond polarity, and they're called permanent dipole-dipole forces and hydrogen bonding, which they're both quite similar, but hydrogen bonding is the absolute strongest of the three types of intermolecular force, and that only appears in particular circumstances with particular non-metals in the simple covalent molecule. If you want to learn more about these, I have made A-level chemistry videos about them, but I think that's enough about these forces for now. Earlier, when I drew ammonia, I drew a structure that looked like this. And in that structure, you can see that we've got three electron shells overlapping between the nitrogen and the hydrogen, and we've got three single covalent bonds, because that's a pair of electrons being shared in each point. But as we know, nitrogen is in group five of the periodic table, so instead of having 
three dots only. We need five in total, which is why we've got this pair of dots at the bottom of the diagram. Now this is called a lone pair of electrons, and that is a phrase that you need to use at A-level chemistry. And that pair of electrons is called lone because it's by itself in a way, or it's only affiliated with one of the elements. It's not bonded to two atoms, it's just attracted to that nitrogen. And those lone pairs are really significant at A level. They affect a number of things. One of the things that they affect is the boiling point of simple molecules. And so simple small molecules that have got lone pairs of electrons are typically attracted to each other quite strongly. And you would expect them to have those intermolecular forces that I've just been mentioning, dipole-dipole forces or hydrogen bonding. And so as a general rule, if you have got a simple molecule that has got a lone pair in that structure, you would expect it to have a stronger intermolecular attraction, not as strong as an ionic bond or anything or a covalent bond, but definitely stronger than a molecule that doesn't have these lone pairs of electrons. I'm going to finish this video by talking about giant covalent structures, which hopefully you'll remember from GCSE level. And we don't actually need to go that much deeper at A level, but you do need to bring all of that complicated stuff with you and remember it well. The two that you come across most typically at GCSE level are diamond and graphite, and those are both allotropes of carbon, which means that they're both made of carbon, but because of a dramatically different structure, they have got dramatically different properties, so therefore different names. The third one that you will have encountered is silicon dioxide, which is sometimes called silica, and that typically forms a giant covalent structure called quartz, which you can encounter by picking up rocks out in the countryside, and it is a typical building material and a structural material. So these are all giant covalent structures, sometimes referred to as macromolecules, although I'm not a big fan of that word, I do want you to know it, but I think sometimes the word molecule is misleading because they are dramatically different to simple covalent molecules. Unlike simple covalent molecules, the melting points and the boiling points of giant covalent structures are incredibly high. And that's because in a giant covalent lattice, say, of diamond, you will have millions of atoms of carbon covalently bonded together. Now, in order to melt diamond, what you have to do is you have to break every single one of those covalent bonds. And they are incredibly strong and they need huge amounts of energy to break. So in order to turn that diamond into something other than its solid structure, you have to provide a huge amount of energy. And so typically the melting point of diamond is something like three and a half thousand degrees C, which when you compare it to water's zero degrees C or methane's minus 182 degrees C, it is colossally huge to say that essentially diamond is just made out of carbon, which doesn't even form polar bonds with other carbon atoms. Graphite, similarly, really high melting point. Quartz that I've mentioned, 1650 degrees C, so really high melting points. And the same is true of boiling points as well. The boiling points of giant covalent structures are incredibly high because, again, you are breaking all of these strong covalent bonds, millions of them. If we consider the other two properties, solubility, the solubility of giant covalent structures is basically zero. Covalent macromolecules are not soluble in water at all. And the reason for that is exactly what we've just discussed for the boiling point and the melting point. In order to get a macromolecule to dissolve, you would have to break all of those millions of covalent bonds joining those atoms together. There is really no way at all that you could provide enough energy to make that happen with a huge beaker of water, say. That water would vaporise long before you could get that diamond to dissolve. So there is no way that those particles will separate. This is particularly obvious when you consider the fact that diamond and graphite 
are neutral particles, so the structure does not have any attraction to the incoming water molecules. And so there is no way that the attraction between the water molecules will be broken and replaced with new attractions because the particles have got no attraction for the water molecules that could be doing the dissolving, but very definitely wouldn't. And last of all, electrical conductivity. Now, as I've just said, these particles are not charged. And so generally, giant covalent structures are electrical insulators as well, just like the simple covalent molecules are. And that, again, that's because there are no charged particles that are free to move through the structure. The exception for that is graphite. Because graphite actually only has three covalent bonds per carbon atom, and as we know, carbon should have four, one electron for each carbon atom is delocalized and free to move through that structure. So graphite would conduct electricity both in its solid and its liquid form. But that is very much the exception. None of the other giant covalent substances do. Okay, I hope you found this Head Start video useful. If you want to find out more about A-level chemistry for this topic, check out some of the links in the description. If you found it a bit tricky and want to go over this topic a little bit more slowly and in more detail, I'll put links to my GCSE explanation videos in the description as well. But that's all for now. I'll see you again soon.